can see your name. I can't see you yet. I don't know. I don't know why. Yeah, it must take a while. There you go. I see you. <laughs> Um, so you said, was it Chris wanting to get in right now? Yeah, I guess, I guess they don't, they don't have the link. Oh, I, weird. I or maybe it. they well, I couldn't find it. Okay. Do you think I should resend something? Maybe just resend that email that you'd sent. Okay. Let me see. All right, I resent. Okay. I resent it. Very good. Is everybody out of your house? Yes. They've been threatened within an inch of their lives. <laughs> That's so funny. I love you, but nobody's coming in this house till eight o'clock. Are you looking at, I, I changed the order of one of the questions. Okay, cool. I'm good with that. But you probably look at your phone, right? Um, no, actually I pull it up on the computer. Oh, good. So we're all good. Um, sorry, I'm still getting adjusted. Looking for something else to make my computer higher. Better. Oh, much better. better. <laughs> much better. <laughs> that made a big difference. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so he they emailed you that they needed it, or was it? Um, so he, I mean, I, I was, hello to everyone here. <laughs> Just getting set up. We get our bearings. Okay, I see that he sent it. All right, I'll email him real fast. Okay. Hello, how hey. are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. So glad that you got the link. Um, when Elizabeth texted me, I was like, oh no. <laughs> I know, I, I just couldn't find it. I I'm sure you probably sent it before. but You're I not the first author that has asked. I think that Zoom must just kind of bury it or something or the people. Yeah. So don't even worry. Um, I'm Allison. I'm one of the co-owners of Fabled Bookshop. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Elizabeth. I think we've met lots on the on the Instagrams. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what? is it one o'clock oh. in the morning or two o'clock there? It's one o'clock, so it's not too bad. The three o'clock. Right. That is amazing. I feel honored that you would stay up so late. That's like no, I'm a bit of a night owl anyway, so I sit up writing. So it's it's not it's not a hardship. That's good. I, you have kids. I studied abroad in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like, I yeah. studied abroad in England in the '90s, and um, so I was really good at going back in time six hours. Yeah. So. Okay. Where did you study? I was um, at Westminster School, so okay. our my college had a. So I, I ate my lunches on the wood from the Spanish Armada ships, nice. and traveled all over England. It was amazing. Yeah, it's um, London is lovely. Yeah, I it's not it's not the same at the moment. I went into town last last Thursday and it's just like a ghost town. It's really strange. Yeah. And my daughter wants to go. And I'm like, let's wait till it gets a little more normal. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. it means a lot to me, the town. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. Um, how is it there? Um, it's so hot. <laughs> yeah, it's hot here actually. It's been hot. really hot, freakishly hot. I uh, got my air conditioning in my car fixed today and I was driving it. I was like, did they fix it? 
or am my expectations too high for what it could do? Because as I looked at my phone, I was like, it's 95. I mean, I don't know what I should expect, but. Uh, that, is hot. that is hotter than we, we've got it. Yes. What are, what's the degrees there? I don't, I, so we know it in Celsius, which oh, is course. like 27, 28, something like that. Okay. Which is hot for London, really yes, hot. That is hot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we've got a massive storm coming on Thursday, and then it's that, that's the end of it, apparently. So are you, so you are in London or outside of it? You said um, I'm just outside in Hertfordshire, so it takes me like 20 minutes on the train to go into the West End. Yeah, it's not far. Love it. That's so awesome. Well, we can start. We have a few participants here. We had a lot of people sign up for this. That's good. The good thing about our book club um, interviews is that we record them. So if people aren't able to come, they are always viewing them as recordings later. So I'm sure we'll have more people trickle in. Um, But your book is beloved here for sure. That's nice to hear. Yeah. So I'll do a little intro for everyone, kind of explaining how it's all going to work. And then Elizabeth will introduce you. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody that has come in. We, um, if you've been a part of our book club before, we have a chat available and the Q&A available um, as we talk. If you have a question for us, a question for Chris, a question about the book, uh, we have our own questions and they may overlap with yours, but we will try our best to get to yours. Um, so feel free to even start typing them now. And if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, you can. I love always seeing how many people from all over the world that visit our book club it's amazing this is the best thing i think about covid is that it's connected us outside of our town with so many people who have been so supportive to us that's great but yeah so here we are hopefully you've read it otherwise there's spoilers ahead um we begin at the end by chris whitaker and i'll have elizabeth introduce all right so we're talking tonight with chris whitaker who lives in the united kingdom with his wife and three young children when not writing he works part-time at a local library where he gets to surround himself with books we know that feeling and love it too uh, he has two other books that he's written called uh, tall oaks and all the way girls uh, we are so happy to have you here tonight with us chris thank you for having me i've been looking forward to this one Well, I have to tell, I want to tell everyone kind of the origin of how I've fallen in love with your book. I got to hear you speak in October at a um, book selling conference for Mountains and Plains Independent Bookstore Alliance. And um, I just, I fell in love with your story. I thought this sounds like a book that I'd like to pick up. I love reading books by authors I have not read before. So I read this book, I think in a day, it is Obviously, I read a whole lot. This is on my lifetime best books. I loved it so much. Um, But I picked it, the Currently Reading podcast does an indie press list, and I picked it for the very first indie press list. So you basically gave it to a um, book club of 1,200 women. And my own personal book club tonight is joining us. So shout out to the Between the Wines book club. They're all joining on one account tonight here. I love that that name, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. We take it very seriously. Um, So needless to say, this this book is just holds a special place in my heart. And getting to speak to you tonight is a a huge privilege. So we're so happy to have you here tonight. Well, um, yeah, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much. Um. So I wanted, if everyone is coming in and didn't know, um, Chris is coming from the other side of the world and he has stayed up t- um, till 1 a.m. to talk about this. Well, actually, you already stay up late, you said. So maybe this is just a regular working hour for you. Yeah, well, kind of. So we've got an 11-month-old daughter and she's teething. So there's no sleep ever. We're just awake all the time. But I, <laughs> we've lived those days, for sure. Um, I... Okay, so I read this book when Elizabeth was pressing it into my hand saying you must read it. Um, I am a huge fan of Westerns. I love True Grit. This had so many hits for it. And so when we saw the book released um, and then hit the New York Times bestseller, I feel like we were kind of like um, the moms cheering it along. Like, oh my gosh, look at it. It's doing so well. We were so thrilled because, you know, sometimes it's for us in the book industry when we get... Uh, we have meetings with our publishing reps. I mean, they can sell us some books that are not that great, or they sometimes will pass over books that I'm like, this book is amazing. And they did, they came out really strong with your book. And and we're, I guess, 
kind of the prideful ones that are kind of like, okay, well, we'll, we'll be the judge of that. But when we read your book and loved it so much, I think I was telling my husband he needed to read it. It's just one of those that are, I mean, like Elizabeth was saying, like just so, so great. Yeah, thank you. Um, they did. They they really went to bat for me. They um, it, we we had a long lead, you know, beforehand. Um, so I've had a long time to get nervous for the US launch. So wow. to have it to have it so well received has been. I so I, I would say a dream come true, but I didn't I didn't expect it at all. I didn't even dream it. Really, it's been amazing. I would love to hear kind of your journey about um, even like when the idea came to your head all the way to when you see it he hit the new york times okay so yeah so it's quite a long story but i shall i, shall, I won't bore you um so i was we at school but um back when i was a teenager and um didn't really know what i was doing with my life i kind of i was i had a lot of friends that wanted to be doctors and lawyers and things like that so they were they were on the path that they wanted to be on and i was a bit my parents would probably say i didn't apply myself and i was a bit directionless that's fair to say so I just I just thought something would come to me but um I didn't take it all that seriously because I, I got really drunk before my economics exam and missed the exam the next day because I was really hung over and um, I was that kind of student <laughs> so um I um I didn't really have the option to go to university um I could have reset my exams but nothing appealed enough so I thought I'll go out and try loads of different jobs so I kind of bounced around for a while. I did some bar work and um, so worked in sales. And I did, I did so many jobs looking back at it because I was talking to my kids the other day about um, what they want to be when, they, when they're older. And my youngest son wants to be a police dog. So, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I think he's following in my, my footsteps. So. <laughs> but, um, did you, out of interest, did you know that you wanted to work with books? For us, do we, do we want to know? I I mean, I always love to read. We are actually a pretty young bookshop. I mean, we're nearing like our two year anniversary in August. Um, I always love to read and, um, but my background's in marketing. Mm -hmm. And so I always kind of had that, like back in my head, I would love to open a bookshop, but I had very specific things I wanted to be or do. And I always said I would not open it up without coffee, but I didn't know coffee. And so my um, co-owner, owns a couple coffee shops in town and an ice cream shop and she loves books just as much as I do. So we kind of, it's, it's probably for you, I would say like on a project where you just start with something so small, like we just had a conversation and then it built up and built up for a couple of years. And then, you know, we opened in 2019. Of course, then we had a pandemic, which was kind of a downer. <laughs> so, and we, at one point, I think we, we were realizing that we had been open longer in the pandemic than actually being open. So what we knew was people wearing masks. It was such a strange yeah. phenomenon, but it's been great. I mean, it's like anything where it's really hard and we're constantly pivoting, but, um, but it's so much fun. It's so much fun to just connect with people who love books and fall in love with stories. So, yeah, yeah. So, so it kind of found you, you know, your, yeah. So I, um, I, d I had faith that something would find me, but I was, um, I was out, um, working as a real estate agent and I was out dropping leaflets through people's doors and um, someone came up to me and asked to borrow my cell phone and um, and I knew I was going to get mugged because I'm a Londoner and I know what mugging entails so um, but he I was 19 and quite bra feeling quite brave and he was um, not particularly big and he was on his own so I thought I'll just say no and um, knew that I would get into a fight I, I kind of worked at thought that I might get a black eye or something like that. And, um, and then he pulled out a kitchen knife and um, stabbed me three times in the side and, and then um, dropped the knife and I dropped my phone and he picked up both and ran off. And, um, and I got, I didn't realize I'd been stabbed because the adrenaline was going. Um, so I, until I looked down and saw blood everywhere and um, got, I managed to get back to my car and got to the, drove myself to the hospital and just about made it there before I blacked out and, um, and then got stitched back together. And it wasn't that bad. I mean, it was in, in my side and it kind of missed everything important. And so I got told that I was lucky and I felt terribly unlucky. Um, but, but to this day, I'm, I'm terrible at asking for help. 
and I would rather just put on a brave face. Like my mum's a bit like that. When, when my parents split when I was quite young and she worked in a bakery in the day and a liquor store in the evening, like pretty much every day. And she just never complained ever. She has that kind of single mum toughness. So I think I learned that from her, you know, just to put a brave face on it. Um, so I told everyone I was okay. Um, but I didn't know about PTSD. I didn't know what it was or why, you know, all of a sudden I couldn't sleep and I wasn't eating and, and I couldn't read a book or watch TV or I'd go out running um, and just run so far that I'd get a bus back home again because <laughs> I I'd, I'd just in the middle of nowhere. So I kind of lost it for a while. And, um, and, and the lack of sleep thing, you know, when you've got a baby and it's the hardest thing, because we've got an, a new, uh, an 11 month old now, and you kind of don't feel like yourself anymore, you know, a few nights of, of no sleep at all. And so I, it went on like that for a long time. And, and then I, um, I was going to take a load of painkillers because it was so bad that I couldn't find a way out of it. And, um, and I sat down to write my parents kind a, a letter just kind of explaining how I was feeling at the time. And, um, and I got a book from the library um, and it was a self-help therapy book. And it talked about a technique where you take the traumatic incident and you, um, you change the characters involved to fictional characters. You change the location to a fictional location and, and, um, and you change the outcome. And it's, it's, it's kind of distraction. And I think it kind of gives you a way to take control of the situation. And, um, and I changed the character involved to Duchess um, 20 years ago. She kind of appeared almost fully formed on the page. You know, I had this vision of this girl wearing a Stetson and carrying a gun and, and outwardly being quite vulnerable, but, but also being really tough. And, um, and I changed the location to, to the US because, um, like I said before, my parents divorced and my, I'm really close with my dad and all of a sudden he wasn't around. And, he took my brother and I on a holiday to the US to um, to do the theme parks in Florida and um, and it was just the best time I'd ever had and so in the book it says to choose a time when you were last happy and, and perhaps change the location to there so I said it in the US um, in, in Montana in particular because we got talking to a family from Montana and they told us it was like heaven on earth you know like this, just this beautiful idyllic place and, um, and so that got me through that night writing that. I wrote the bar scene in the book where Duchess's mother is playing guitar on the stage and being heckled and Duchess sticks up for her, you know, cause she's quite brave um, and in your face a bit. Um, and so that, that got me through that night. And, and then I went to bed and slept and having not slept for a long time, it was, it was a big kind of like a miracle. All of a sudden I could sleep. It was like finding a new skill. So, um, that got me through the next few weeks and then and then I got really drunk and um and we had been taking drugs as well just to try and get through it and um I went out and flipped my car over I drove it off the side of the road and have a scar down my cheek there that is like a constant reminder you know when I'm shaving every morning it's just like I wish it wasn't there really because it's like a constant reminder of that time and um um obviously my parents were really disappointed because they didn't know what was going on and, um, and I still wasn't telling anyone. So I went back to writing again and I, I kind of, I wrote random scenes from Duchess's life. You know, it wasn't a book. It was just, it was just a writing exercise. I didn't particularly want to be a writer, um, didn't give it any thought. Um, and then a, a year later, I by chance picked up a newspaper and read an article about a stockbroker. And, um, because I needed something to be, you know, I needed a career. I was like early twenties and and didn't know what was what to do with my life. And and it seemed like a good job, you know. It seemed really well paid, and it seemed like like this guy had a Ferrari, and and um and I thought I I'll be a stockbroker. And um, I'm bad at maths, and I don't, you know, like economics. I didn't do well at, as I said before. But I I went into the city, into London, with my um with my CV. And, um, and they, one company took pity on me, I think, just because <laughs> it was so bad, my CV. And they gave me a job as a junior stockbroker. And, um, and I loved it, you know, I, I'm, I was quite well suited to it because I, I was still wasn't, a, I'm still not a good sleeper now. So it was a lot of client entertaining. So I'd be out till the early hours, then back at my desk at half six. And um, so for a young man, it was quite good fun. 
but um that that kind that life went hand in hand with a lot of drinking and and taking drugs and being like an 80s cliche stockbroker <laughs> so um on the surface again I was doing okay but um mentally I'm not that sure and um and I wanted to be a trader that was my dream job I wanted to to take the money the company made and reinvest it and and not have clients and kind of make my own decisions so I asked my boss to it to give me a shot on the trading desk and um and he agreed a bit reluctantly but he said they set me a limit of twenty thousand dollars and if I broke that then I had to stop trading and and we could talk about what went wrong and um and I came in on my first day and lost two million dollars and um and didn't tell anyone because um I didn't want to get in trouble basically so one of my friends worked in the in the back office so I said to him let's hide it which is illegal um and I will make it back you know it was like it was like a Nick Leeson thing on a smaller scale but um obviously I couldn't make it back because I wasn't great at the job um, so I lost a bit more money and then I came into work one morning and there was like a glass um, conference room and I, I walked in and there was no one around but everyone was in there like all the bosses the lawyers people like that and there was an empty chair at the end of the table and I was directed to it <laughs> so I thought um, this is not going to go well and um, and they kind they gave me an ultimatum and that kindly they said to me you know we can either go to the police which they could have or um, you can pay back half the money because I'd started to get the hang of the job and I was making some money at that point. So, so I signed a contract. It was like a no brainer there and then and, um, and rode the train home at 24 years old and a million dollars of debt. And, um, and I went back to not telling anyone anything. Like, and I was engaged at the time and we, on the surface, I was doing really well. And I liked this, this image of myself, you know, I wasn't like the screw up because my brother was quite high achieving and went to a brilliant university and my parents never had to worry about him. So I liked that they, that everyone thought I was doing well. So I just kept that going and just didn't tell it, say anything. And um, um, our wedding costs were spiraling and I was just putting it on the credit card. And <laughs> I just thought I'd worry about it later because I was in so much debt. And, um, and so I went back to drinking, taking too much, taking drugs, things like that. And, um, and eventually found my way back to Duchess to, to get through that time and, um, and went back to writing again. And so carried on, you know, I'd, I'd have a really tough day in the city and then come home and mentally travel 4,000 miles to Montana. And it was, it was a real, real good escape for me. And she got me, that character got me through that time and, um, and then I was nearing 30 and began to really think about, you know, what, what I wanted to do. And I read a book called The Last Child by John Hart. I don't know if you've read any John Hart books. I read every one of his books. Oh, how good is <laughs> it? So good, isn't it? Yeah. We interviewed yeah. him in February. Yeah. Oh, okay. I did, I did an event with him um, a few months ago and I got to tell him this story, which oh. was really cool. I know, and he's just the best. He's so lovely. And um, so... So I read The Last Child and it was just the best crime novel I'd ever read. You know, the best mystery. It was just beautifully written and um, emotional. And, and I sought out an interview with John afterwards. And he, um, he was a lawyer and he just quit because he wanted to be a writer. You know, and I thought it was a really brave um, thing to do. And I was inspired. And so I was, I was nearly 30 and and on the path to making quite a lot of money and, and everything was settled. And my wife was pregnant and a student, so we were very much dependent on me. And, um, and I walked into my boss's office and quit my job, <laughs> just, just, just because I had read this interview with John Hart. And, and um, so I got home and told my wife that I'm gonna be a writer, I'm gonna write a book, because writing was the only constant that I'd had up until that point. And um, obviously she, she didn't know that I'd ever written anything. Um, so it was, a, it was a surprise to her, you know, that I'd kind of ruined everything. <laughs> but she was very supportive because I think she knew that I hadn't been happy and I'd been struggling. And um, so overnight our lives changed, you know, the security was gone. We sold our apartment, sold our car and then um, moved to Spain for a while because the, the cost of living was less and we wanted to get away from London. So we lived there and I wrote my debut, Tall Oaks. And... Um, and then we came back to the UK because then I realized you needed an agent 
and a publishing deal. Like I didn't know any of this stuff and I didn't know, you know, agents are hard to come by. It's quite competitive to get an agent. Um, so I, I um, applied to a load of agents and luckily enough, a few of them wanted to meet with me. So we went back to London. I signed um, with the agent that I'm still with now. And, um, and then Tall Oaks was published. And um, so I wrote Tall Oaks and then I wrote, it, it won an award Tall Oaks. You can't, it's just out of shot there, but it's like your Edgar awards you know it's a big deal over here um because because tall x didn't sell that well but it was quite well reviewed so we went to this like award ceremony thinking we're not going to get <laughs> anywhere we just go because it's a free meal in a fancy hotel so we went and then i won and hadn't written a speech or anything so I messed it up but remember to thank my wife because she was she was she was kind of key in all of this and then um then i wrote my second book and then i found myself in a strange place because the two books had come out and then I signed another two book deal with my UK publisher. And, um, and every time I logged into my computer, I saw a file marked Duchess, you know, and I just kind of left it alone, but it felt a bit like there was some unfinished business. So I, um, I went out for dinner with my editor and I pitched this, this book. And I said to her, it's a book about, um, kind of a book about revenge and, um, and a bit like a Western and, um, I think she looked at me like I was a bit mad because, you know, I have no business telling <laughs> writing a Western. And um, and I said to her, I'll deliver it in six months. And then three years later, they got a first draft of the book. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, man, I feel like we might be lost Chris. Hopefully we did. Oh my gosh. And I'm like very invested in this story. I <laughs> want to hear the rest. I know. Okay, maybe I'm looking at different choices. Consider this just an intermission, everybody. You know, the only time I've ever been mugged was in England also. And it was um, a gypsy. A oh. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Man, Sorry I Sorry about that. Like on a cliffhanger. I was like, what? <laughs> okay, sorry. My uh, my computer just crashed for oh. some reason. Well, I've, I've joined on my phone now. Okay, great. So, yeah, so I had the, the file Mark Duchess and um, and I got going on the book and um, and I still didn't really want it to be published. You know, when it was done, it felt it's strange because although it's about Duchess, it felt really personal. So I... Um, I finished it and then luckily it landed on the desk of Amy Einhorn in the US. And um, and she's just such a brilliant editor. And um, and she we got on the phone together and she kind of instantly knew, picked out the parts of the book that I wasn't happy with. And um and then um and then we worked together for a few years on the book. So it felt like a 20-year road to publication, but you know, from actually writing it was probably three or four years. And um and then the book launched in the US and I was really nervous about it because obviously I'm in the UK writing a book set in a place that I've never been. And, um, and then I missed the call. So I was, our daughter was teething and I was putting her to bed and, and I missed the call telling me that it was a New York Times bestseller. Oh. So I will forever remind my daughter of that, you know, as she gets older. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, um, and that is a very long answer to your question and kind of brings us up to date. Well, the thing, obviously, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, what I loved about this book was Duchess. And I don't know, I was a really good kid, but for some reason I love these stinker girls. I think of Scout and To Kill a Mockingbird or Anna Green Gables. And even, um, it, it makes me laugh, these current books, my, my two favorite little girls are Flavia de Luce from The Sweetness of the Bottom of the Pie and Duchess, and they were both written by a Canadian man and a British man. So I'm, I'm curious, I, I just want to delve a little bit more into Duchess. I mean, she was utter perfection um, as a character. So what made you decide she was going to be an outlaw? How did you channel your energies into a 13-year-old girl? I mean, that's a hot mess for a, a, for a man. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, with difficulty, actually. It was... Um... At the start, it wasn't that hard because it wasn't going to be a book. You know, it didn't need to be authentic or anything. It just, um, she was like, 
kind of like a vessel, you know, for me to project. You know, if I was angry, I'd make her ten times angrier. If I was um, if I was struggling, she'd she'd struggle much worse than I. So there was always someone doing worse than me, you know. When I sat down to write, like, and I used to think if she can get through what she's getting through, then I should be able to as well. But um, as for writing her, God, it was just a nightmare actually it was really difficult you know once once I started turning it into a book I probably spent a solid year writing Duchess just her dialogue you know over and over again and again trying to get it right and make it feel right and um when I started writing I wasn't age-wise I wasn't as far from her as I was when I when I actually got down to it but um I didn't worry too much until later on I just um I'm a strong believer in like a gut feeling, you know, so I thought if, if it feels right, then then we're on the right track. And um, and obviously I had help from the best in the business, you know, an amazing team at Holt in the US. Um, but I spent that, like I found a, a website where you can listen to people talk. You can, um, it's as boring as it sounds, you know, you can put in like an area where someone's from and listen to them just read transcripts, people of different ages, and you can pick up on speech patterns and things like that. And um, and then I read some case studies of girls that and children that had been through something similar to Duchess and um, watched interviews and things like that. And and that that rage that she has, you know, that um, and that inability to let anyone get close to her. I mean, she goes to live with her grandfather and, and the closest that she comes to kind of warming to him is allowing him to make her a drink and put it down somewhere and then she'll pick it up and um and and that's um i've had people that have been through similar things to duchess message me and um or have adopted a daughter or one woman in particular she messaged to say that they had been through that exact same thing you know and it took them a long time just to be able to make make dinner for their daughter and um it's just just tough isn't it some people have such a tough time um like i mentioned before i felt like this book but really, it really felt like a Western to me, which, and I think since we, you know, are from Texas, any book that is written by someone who's not from the West, we were kind of like, we give it a little bit of a side eye, but I started reading yeah. it, I was like, okay, well, I will allow it because it's good. And it does <laughs> feel like the West. And I kept mm -hmm. trying to remind myself that it wasn't set in Texas because it really had that feel. And I think that's just, just being, um, I, I feel like Texas women are kind of like this. We kind of take care of business. Like we're not mm -hmm. damsels in distress, you know? We, yeah. And I felt like Duchess was like that. Did, um, and it reminded me so much of True Grit and the little girl in True Grit mm -hmm. who's on a mission and, and just headstrong. It, was it a choice to, like when you said you described it as a Western, was it a choice to make it feel like a Western um, like drama? Yeah. Yes and no. It was, um, I read a lot of Cormac McCarthy growing up, you know, and, um, and I read Lonesome Dove and The Assassination of Jesse James and books like that. And, and I love them. And I love that the strength and the, the kind of, you know, how they, they find a family in their, um, in their band of brothers, kind of, and, and Duchess needed that, you know, she needed that, but it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't consciously, I, I set out to write a Western. It was just, it was a bit a book about revenge at the, at the very beginning. It was this little girl, you know, wanting revenge and not really knowing what it was. And, it, you know, as a concept, I'm quite interested by, it. you know, we, bad things happen all the time. And we sentence people to serve time in prison and, you know, and, and, and hope that they rehabilitate and things like that. But as for revenge, I don't know what it brings to anyone really you know if it, if it brings you the closure like Duchess thinks it will bring her some kind of closure you know getting even with the person that's brought so much tragedy to her family but um she's 13 and she she can't see you know the bigger picture but yeah so yes and no really to the western thing with um being British and writing a book set in America I know you mentioned that that was kind of like a, made you a little hesitant. Were there things that you had to go back and edit that to make it feel more American or things that you, I mean, you said you listened to dialects. Was mm -hmm. there, I mean, is, I guess I would be intimidated to write a novel that was set in Britain too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. um, it's a scary thing. 
isn't it? It's um, because pe people do look closely. You know, if someone set a book in London, I know London quite well, but I don't know all of London. You know, so I can't claim that um, to know everything. Like sometimes someone will make a sweeping generalization about where a book is set or something, and so we don't talk like that or something. Like, and, and I think you, yeah, you can't always speak for everyone, but um, it was. It was difficult, um, but it was like the first two books were set in the US as well. So I'd, I'd gotten better and I've always had a US copy editor and proofreader, which helped massively. Like the first book, Tall Oaks, there was so many, so many, it was like learning a different language a bit, just simple things like we say windscreen, whereas you say windshield. And, um, and there's, there's so many of those. And of course, if you get it wrong, it really pulls you out of the story. So it was very important to me, but you know we had such a huge editorial team and and safety net at Hull, and everyone was kind of pulling for this book and um, and trying to you know help it help me make it the best it could be. So, but still, I was very nervous. You know, when it came out in the US, I thought you know I just in in general it's hard you know to to write an adult novel and set it to kind of hang it on the shoulders of a thirteen year old is is a difficult thing and um, something I was wary of but but then one day I was working at the library and um, and got an email from John Hart um, saying that he had read the book so it, I felt um, you know it was a special moment and then the same thing happened again with Kristen Hanna only I was actually shelving Kristen Hanna books when the when my phone went off in my pocket and it was a message from um, from Kristen Hanna so it was you know I've, I feel really lucky that I have these American these great American authors who have read the book and and in, and enjoyed it you know it's way beyond anything I ever dreamed of mm. well another character I dearly loved um, well, look I guess well, I'm not used to the sun going down <laughs> um, but I I loved Hal the the grandfather mm -hmm. the story um, and one of the things that he talks there's a, a little line here um, that he says to the duchess if the good stand by idol are they still good? And it's it's a good question. And I wonder, you know, is he a good grandfather? And would his decision to leave California and to leave his grandchildren and his child who were kind of in peril, I mean, what, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think if, if anything, you know, the book shows that, that good and bad are, are kind of like a concept and and no one is all is is really any one thing, you know. And and I talk about how that, you know, we're all more than the worst things that we've done. And um, and I certainly have lived a life, you know, where I, I have many regrets, but they have led me on this path, you know. And um, you don't you don't know where you'd be had you had you done things differently. But um, I think that the the more time you spend with someone, the less able you should be to put them in a box. You know, we watch TV and and see the news every day. And we often see the worst thing that someone is ever likely to do. And we just get a snapshot of it without the context, you know, and it doesn't change the severity of what they've done. But sometimes context makes you look at things differently. And, um, and so on the surface, how, you know, is a man that has made a huge number of mistakes, you know, and he's, he's kind of ostracized himself and, and moved to Montana to live this quiet life away from everyone um, because he doesn't want to hurt anyone. And then all of a sudden he's he's got this, you know, this 13 year old girl who is his granddaughter that he's never met and and her six year old brother um, all of a sudden living with him. And he, he has to learn how to be, you know, it's been a long time since he was a parent and a father. And um, and so they kind of figure it out together. And Duchess is very unforgiving. You know, she is um, probably his worst nightmare. But. I, I think, you know, in, in the, the time that they spend together in the book, he's probably happier than, than he has been in a long time, you know, and they're feeling each other out and, um, and, and there's a respect there, I think. You know, Duchess, it's hard earned, but there is kind of a quiet respect for her grandfather and, um, and that's, I think, more than he probably ever would have hoped for. I love that. Um, Brenda, um, who is joining us, says Hal had the patience of Job and so much love for the grandkids despite rejection from Star. Loved Hal. And we also had someone, which I do want to cast um, if, if people in this, um, this book as a movie. 
later, but um, someone mentioned that they thought of Clint Eastwood as Hal. Yeah. Like, it's a great absolutely. casting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, yeah, he would be a good Hal. And yeah, he was kind of, yeah, slightly in mind when I was writing Hal. But I just, um, Hal's tough, isn't he? Um, and you can see some Duchess in Hal. And um, and I like that, you know, that he couldn't be he couldn't be too hard on her because, you know, he hadn't really he knew that he hadn't really earned the right to be a grandfather. And also, I imagine he saw himself in her as well and, um, and must have been slight, like when she stands up for um, Robin at school, you know, a little brother gets it, it's not really bullying. It's just child's play. And um, the Duchess takes it to a level like she always does. And then Hal gets called in and um, and just defends her to the headmaster. And I quite like that. That's so good. When you write characters, do you different, differentiate, this is kind of piggybacking of, of Elizabeth's question, do you differentiate with good and bad characters? Are they all nuanced in your mind? Um, yeah, all, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't make anyone bad and no one is, no one is a plot device. You know, they're all the star of their own story, kind of. And, um, yeah, I don't, I, I never go into it thinking like that. I just, you know, if someone does something bad in my book, I, I find the angle, you know, to look at and, and see why they did it. And because it's far more interesting, I think, than the act itself. You know, when you're writing a mystery or a crime novel, the actual crime itself is usually the least interesting thing in the book. And, um, and the reasons behind it and the effect are the things that I'm interested in. I love that. It's very true. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, a lot of the, the girls who are, I keep having to move because I'm not used to um, the sun going down during our interviews. She's giving a tour of her house here. Yeah, I know. Like I'm trying to, keep, I keep changing and nothing is helping. So this is, this is what Texas sun looks like in June. So, um, but I, I, we were all very, one of the things that all these, the currently reading, um, people were talking about was your unique writing style. So can you speak to that a little bit? The, the, the smaller sentences, maybe the, the, um, yeah. So that, that is, um, it's funny because when I, when I went back to write the book, I, um, I kept the style that I had written in when I was 19. So before I was like a writer, um, which I still struggle with that I might be a writer, you know, <laughs> I don't feel like a writer, but um, I kept, I kept that kind of style, you know, I'd obviously been detached slightly when I wrote it, you know, because it was a writing exercise and there was a bluntness to it. You know, I was just, I was writing these, these quite difficult things for people to go through in quite an unsentimental way. And, um, and it worked, you know, it worked for the character of Duchess Walk. You get a bit more, you know, like when he's driving, through the from California to Montana you get more description with him but Duchess's scenes tend to be more curt and um yeah it was it was just staying true to that character that I'd written at the time because it felt right you know it felt more authentic and it felt like I should stick with how I'd I'd written it at the time hmm. um I love the title so much. I feel like that is really what drew me to the book. Um, would you explain kind of background and did you have any other working titles in your writing? Uh, no, I had, so the first two books that I wrote, the, um, I gave them titles and then they were changed by once the sales department get involved and things yeah. like that. And so this time around, I thought I'm just gonna, I, I, di I didn't know, I'm not good at, with, with the titles and things like that. So I just, there's a prologue at the start um, you know at the very start of the book where a child dies and um, and I called that we begin at the end because it felt like it felt like we were beginning at the end of a lot of these characters lives you know like not the actual end because they're not dying but but they don't move past it because in the next chapter we skip ahead 30 years and we find that Walk who is the chief of police has not moved on you know he's still looking back over his shoulder 30 years later um, Star, who was involved at the, in that chapter at the beginning, is still a mess, you know, and Duchess was born long after the event and, and she's kind of born into this shadow, under this shadow that she can't outrun. So it felt, it felt like the end of the story for a lot of these characters. And, and the, book, the book looks at whether you can move past something like that, you know, and, and that, um, you know, that, that shadow that it cast, you know, trauma like that, I'm, 
you know I lived most of my life like that you know looking looking back and wondering what might have been and things like that and um yeah it, it just it was it I was glad when they pulled it out my editor in the UK suggested it as the title and um, and I didn't think they would because you know it's not an overtly crime or mystery title necessarily you know but then the book isn't you know I see the book as like a coming of age story first and foremost and um and it's quite difficult you know when I shelve the book at the library I never know where to put it so I end up putting it everywhere <laughs> and um and I think it fits in general fiction you know more than anywhere else you know it's just uh, people go into it without really knowing much about it and I think that's probably the, the best way to do it because sometimes people when you say it's a crime novel over in the UK they, they expect like a James Patterson type book you know and, and and it's definitely not that you know it's it's a book about family so no um, we, we had those discussions every day <laughs> where do we put this book is it a literary fiction is it a mystery yeah so we we feel you there <laughs> I love that you get to shelve your own book. I mean, literally to start the story and then like I, the book's and, cycle of life. Yeah, and we had, um, cause, cause of lockdown, you know, the library stayed open for, for a click and collect so you could order online and then we got to choose books. So I just gave everyone my book, you know, it was never in stock. Amazing. <laughs> I know, no matter what you ask for. Yeah, whatever you ask for, you will get one of my books. You've like um, infiltrated them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely that was amazing yeah so what do you like to read what are some who are some of your favorite authors besides john hart um i read Den I, I love dennis lehane i think he's a brilliant writer um margaret atwood um i read a lot of teenage ya fiction in the uk um because i like the pace of it and um the hate you give that was a brilliant book i really love that and um i really love the book thief and that that is shelved in the in the YA section, actually, interestingly. But I think that's a book that, you know, anyone can read. Um, you know, it kind of fits really well. Um, Cormac McCarthy, I said before, you know, I've read The Road. Oh, I can't I don't even know how many times I've read it because it, it reads a bit differently and you notice new things every single time. Um, and I grew up reading um, Stephen King when I was way too young. I read um, it and The Shining, and because my dad used to shelve them like out of my reach. And I, so I was fascinated because I thought, what could possibly be in a book, you know, that, that I, I didn't know that a book could terrify you until I was about 11 and I read it. And um, yeah, and, I, and John Grisham is brilliant. You know, John Grisham books, you can just pick up and start reading and, and all of a sudden you're halfway through and you've lost hours of your day and you don't know what's happened and it's such a skill to tell to tell stories in that way so great a lot of our favorites too um so are there any plans for this to be a movie or a miniseries has anyone approached you yes yeah so i had this um this crazy week where I was working in the library in the day and meeting with Hollywood studios in the evening. <laughs> Just <laughs> like that's my normal life. Yeah. And um and so so we had a few offers from like the really, really big studios and, and I went with Disney in the end because I met Jennifer Todd and Thomas Kale, Tommy, who um who directed Hamilton. And I love Hamilton. I, I really Hamilton is a masterpiece, you know, it's just and um and they got duchess in in such a special way you know we had this brilliant meeting and just talked about what could become of it and um and it's disney isn't it at the end of the day you know it's it's they're huge and um and i just felt like they you know the, the team they had in place it just it was a perfect fit so for tv it will be hopefully um they're finding a list of writers at the moment because um I wouldn't know where to begin. You know, it's a, a totally different skill, I think, to try and adapt it, but it's very exciting. And, and people like to send me um, their, their ideas for the characters, which is very cool. So who do you, well, I always envision, and I've heard people envision Hopper from Stranger Things as Walk. David yeah, Harper. he's the number one. He's the number one, but um, I, I struggle with any of them, you know, because that they're my characters that have lived in my head for too many years. So um, I, I see them as I see them, and, and obviously they're not based on anyone. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be a good walk, I do, yeah. Have you have any other people like say certain act? I mean, I also thought of Margot 
Robbie a star. But this She'd be a good star. Be a big yeah, she would be a good star. Um, I get quite a few. Yeah, they have to explain it to me. What'd you say, Elizabeth? Who's, who's Margot Robbie? You, I don't know that she, you may have not seen anything that she's been in. She's big. She's big. She's, Elizabeth is more of the reader, not the watcher. So sometimes I have, we have to be like, oh, that was in the theaters. Oh, she won an Oscar. Oh, the, yeah. She's I don't she <laughs> Anya, um, the ice skater in the movie. Yeah, that, that was so good, wasn't it? Yeah. She's so good in that. I watched like a linguistics expert like break down how well she did that voice. Like from wow. a young girl to an older woman, how he was like in awe of it. It was so great. And she's Australian or New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think it was right. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is amazing. So do you have anybody else that people repeatedly say? Um, so I get, I get Edge Harris for how. Okay. Yeah, along with Clint Eastwood. Duchess, we never, we hardly ever get anyone. Because um, so we had Baby Madison, um, that someone suggested. Um she she's a tough character to play, isn't it she? Is. I can't, yeah. I, I it would be a hell of a challenge, I think, to anyone. And they'd have to be okay with the um with the colourful language that she uses throughout the book. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sharing so, Disney with that is gonna be interesting. See. Yeah, I, 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 I had um because it's twentieth TV, which it, which Disney owns, so twentieth Century Fox, as I would know them. But um, I've had people messaging when they hear Disney, and they're like outraged, <laughs> like because they think it's going to be a cartoon or like a fairy tale or something. It's obviously not like that. Disney's a big company with many branches. <laughs> but um, yeah, I um, uh, Vince Vaughn for Vincent King. Was this, was one that we that came up? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure about any of them really. I'm sure they'd all do a brilliant job as all of them, and I I should be so lucky to get anyone like that. But still, <laughs> amazing. I can't wait when we watch the Oscars and they're all getting awards. We will remember this book club. Yeah. All that. <laughs> yeah, and I'll go and I won't write a speech. Because that, that, yeah, you're to thank us <laughs> in your yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are there any other questions anyone has? Please check in, Allison. I um. Oh well, I think they were answered. Oh, they all answered. Adriana said, um, talking about portraying such a hard, rough character like Duchess in Disney, will they change her up to be less hard or rageful? Do you uh, have control? Not. Yeah. Um. To a point. Yeah. I get like full well fully consulted and things like that and and there's no way that there will be any watering down of anything of anyone like that I don't I think you know to read the book you know the character and to do anything else would be a disservice to that character I think I have a I have a funny story about that my my husband took our maybe 10 year old daughter at the time she's now 17 almost 17 to um see a disney movie and it was hacksaw ridge we thought it was going to be just fine to watch because it was a disney movie and she introduced to massive amounts of um war violence so we, we gave them a really hard time about taking our daughter to a disney movie so i think disney can handle the language <laughs> disney can handle it it'll be yeah. yeah are you um working on anything else that was a a question that someone asked you and you have a are you working on a new book yeah so i have um a why my ya debut a book called the forevers comes out in the uk next month actually wow. and um i don't know if you can uh, i don't know where they are the copies but it's so beautiful it's the most beautiful book you know the, the actual physical cover um they got an artist to do the um called Nafe to do the cover and it's just it's really beautiful and it's about a um it's going to sound dystopian, but it isn't. It's not like that. It's um, so. Ten years ago, they found um, an asteroid in the sky coming towards Earth, and then um, for ten years they've been trying to stop it and failing. So NASA have been trying to stop this and kind of shoot it down or, or do anything they can. And we're now down to the last summer on Earth, and we're um, we follow a group of teenagers um, in on the in a coastal town in the UK, and um, it kind of looks at. Firstly, what, what would you do if you could get away with anything? You know, if, if consequences are are no longer there, you know, are people innately good? Um, but it's kind of, 
it's a story about that and it's a bit a story about first and last love and um and just a look at what might happen you know how and 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 it's not a new thing you know these these kids in the book they're only 17 um but they've lived with this threat there for most of their lives so it's not like a, a shock or anything it's rather just we slowly ease towards the end and it, and it's whether we can you know keep our morals intact as, as we head there but um i think it will come out in the us hopefully in, in a year later maybe something like that oh i can't wait that sounds mm -hmm. so good i can't believe we have to wait a year <laughs> <laughs> no. and um, and i'm working on the new adult novel um which will be out in if, if i manage to finish it which is a big if will be out in spring 2023 in the us and and the uk at the same time and that's um that's a big us set sweeping crime love story yeah mystery send me an arc. <laughs> Pardon? i said send me an arc i want to read oh, it yeah absolutely 100 percent. yeah <laughs> So fun. Well, Chris, thank you so much. I loved your story. I feel like all of us were just wrapped up in your whole journey to this book, which we all love so much. Um, if you don't mind for like a couple minutes, we're gonna introduce our next month's book. Mm -hmm. um, of course. So I'm gonna let Elizabeth do that. And I will post in the chat a link for everyone to sign up. Um, if, and Chris, you're welcome too as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, I mentioned that uh, We Begin at the End was, it's really tied for my, my favorite book of the year, and the other book is When the Stars Go Dark by Paula McLean. This is sort of a, a little bit of true crime, a little mystery, a little nature writing. Um, it, it's, it's a stunningly beautiful book, and um, I just, I'm so excited that we're going to get to interview Paula McLean, and that'll be July the 13th at 7 o'clock in the evening. So please join us and buy the book. We've got plenty at Fable. So very excited. Thank you again, Chris. We're just so, so thrilled to have you here. And thank you for staying up late for us. And we can't wait to watch the Disney movie. <laughs> Thinking of all the, the things that you've told us. Yes. Um, thank you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, See ya. Bye.